Did I blow the fuse already? Hmm. Maybe that voltage isn't right. I've actually got a couple of boons on RF power meters and they've got the same sockets on them and the idea is you can connect this to the other unit and actually um, simulate a probe and things like that and actually make sure that you're calibrating the other gear. So calibrate for meters probably works. Valuetronics, I've got some stuff from them before. Had no problems with them so far, they've been good. Voltage selection, we should do that now before I forget. We want 240 volts, so I'm guessing which way are those going to be, up or down? I'm guessing that means down, so I think I've just got to do that. I think that would be 240 volts. What do you reckon? Does that make sense? 240 volt, down and down. Am I reading that right? What fuse is in it? What fuse is supposed to be in it? Quarter of an amp. Well, yeah, okay. I think it says three tenths of an amp. Isn't three tenths going to be 300 milliamps? Which I think is what's on there, yeah. Should we power this up now and see if it goes? Or should we find out if we've got any magic smoke coming out? I think I've got the voltage right. Let's find out, shall we? No power draw in the off state. Turn it on. That instantly died. Did that blow the fuse already? Hmm. No, that voltage isn't right. Well, yeah, that fuse blew. You can see there's a dark area in here. Just inside the holder is a bit of a dark area. That was just either unlucky, we've got a problem with the unit, or that voltage selection isn't right. I think I did actually have these switches set wrong, so I've looked at this again based on what was originally set, and that must have been 120 volts setting originally. Now what I've actually done is I've gone in here and put some white paint inside here on both sides of the switch to make it more obvious how it's represented on here. So I think I'd actually set to 100 volts, not 240 volts, which is why the fuse popped. I've replaced the fuse, we'll try powering it up again. All right, let's power it up. See if it survived that little hiccup. It's drawing nine watts. Oh, there we go, we do have a display. It's just not showing up on camera very well because of my lighting. Well, you can't see the display there, but it's definitely very dim. It does have an adjustment just here, but I don't think it's going to be brightness. I think there's going to be contrast. Let's try this really expensive one I've got. <laughs> Yeah, it's purely contrast. It's not very bright, but it is working. Now, if that's just a standard 2x40 display, I might actually have a replacement for that. So if it is a big issue, I might be able to do something with it. Yeah, it's definitely hard to see on a camera. I can actually see it better in person than you can on camera. I'm guessing it's because of lighting or something, maybe? I don't know, maybe it's just... I mean, I can definitely see it myself far better than I can on camera. And it does seem to be doing something. On and off, output on and off, that's doing something. I've got no idea to use this thing yet. Ranges, 1.8 ohms, so 1.8k ohms, up to 500 kilo ohms. Yeah, that's it, so you go between range and kilo ohms, and you output on and off. So, and also you've got local bus thing here, which I don't know how to do. I don't know if it actually outputs anything. So I'm just going to try measuring directly on the jack here. I don't actually have the cable for this, but I'm going to shut the probes in right now because this is easier. So zero range zero, we're currently putting out nothing there. Let's go to millivolts actually, so we can get anything there. Seeing nothing. Let's go range one. Here you go, point one millivolts. Should be ten millivolts, I'm guessing. Is that one millivolt? Maybe ten millivolts, I don't know. Eighty five. Yeah, eight sixty millivolts. One point seven volts. Four point three. Okay, it's as high as it goes, four point three volts. So that's interesting. So it's got these different ranges it can do to generate levels. So that is outputting something at least. Let's look at changing resistances. See one point eight K instead. And step through these again. Okay, 1.8k is probably giving more sensible readings, like better numbers to me. Just rounder numbers, which makes more sense to me. Yeah. So that's what I think. So it's probably 0.09 millivolts there. Well, it's outputting something, so it probably works fine. Just a shame the screen's a bit hard to see on camera. Now, I said before the calibration was due f mm, 2015. Well, if we look here, it's got another sticker here. It was done in the last year, and it's due next year. So, according to this, it's actually under calibration right now. That's brilliant. Next stage of this thing, I was going to wrap it up, leave it as it was, but the fact that the display was not very readable, that's been bugging me quite a bit. I didn't really feel like I'd actually finished the project because I haven't replaced any capacitors, shock horror, and the display, although it was readable without my bright lighting here, I just wasn't happy with it. It's, it's dark. I just didn't feel like it was complete, so I've decided to continue with this and we'll finish it off and do the final bits which I've just been niggling in my mind about not actually being finished. So this actually been put away in the garage for a couple of weeks and I sort of thought, well... 
it's been bothering me for the past couple of weeks that I didn't really finish it. So, we're back. You can kind of see it there, that angle, actually. I can sign of, yeah, you can just about see it there, look at that. There you go. So that is bothering me quite a bit. And the fact that I haven't recapped it. I mean, we already tested it works, it does actually up at the correct levels, stuff like that, so I'm not worried about the actual functionality of it, apart from the display. So that needs to be fixed. So let's open this thing up. That's what's inside it. Not a lot. Obviously there's another board on the other side, but these are capacitors need doing. Now I've got to try and get this board out, which is a little bit more involved, because these are bolted to the side here, and instead of having a screw going this way, the screw comes from the outside, and it's got a trim panel. So it's a bit more involved getting into that. Back of the display is interesting. We've got this little metal box just here. So this little metal box here, that's got a transformer inside there, and that's a high voltage converter. So it's got an electroluminescent backlight. So here's a 5 volt rail here, comes in through this plug. That goes to this little box which has got a transformer in there and a little bit of circuitry which forms an oscillator. So it actually converts a DC into an AC high voltage which is then runs through these wires here to the backlight of the display. Now I've done work on electroluminescent displays in the past which makes me tempted to actually try and repair the display rather than trying to replace it. But there's no guarantee it's actually going to get any better. <laughs> and the other thing is, when this is running, I can actually hear this transformer. I can hear the high voltage AC, I can hear it. Because it winds, it's about 2 kilohertz or so. I can actually hear the thing running. And I don't like that. So, yes, I could potentially replace the display, or I could potentially try and repair the display. That's the challenge I've got right now. Which route do I take? Or which route do I take? Depends on which country you're in, I suppose. So, electroluminescent displays. Now, if you're familiar with those already, it's, it's like, yeah, okay, that's, that's not exactly complicated. But, people which are familiar with them, not so much. Now, this is actually a repair kit. Because I had a old Sony stereo many years ago, I don't know, a dozen years ago, which ended up being no good. That might be the original one here. And basically, you got two layers and it's a phosphor on here and they glow when you put a power across them. You've got contacts here which you stick on and the idea is you can then make a new backlight. Here's the structures. I've had this thing for a dozen years and so this is all cracked up now. It's got these tracks for it. Means it may not work too well. I don't know. Um, but the idea is you just cut it to the size you want, stick some contacts on it and put it back in. Uh, I got this from Pace Electronics, is it? long time ago, so I got this a dozen years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that long time. There you go, I got it from Farnell, that's where I originally bought it from, and obviously they got it from here. That wasn't cheap either, remember, Ollie. I think it was fairly expensive, I think it was like $100 or something for this kit or something like that, it was horrendous. But that was one route I was thinking of doing, is trying to actually repair it with this, and replace the backlight part. That's looking a bit worse for wear, to be honest. Can I actually explain that story? I don't remember. So I had an old Sony stereo which had an electroluminescent backlight in it. This is a, quite an expensive stereo. This thing was like $2,000 when I bought it. This is a car stereo. This is back when I was doing cardio, which is where Def Pong came from. It had fiber optic outputs and stuff like that, so which went to the amps, and, and it was all really high quality, really low noise levels. Um, signal to noise ratio was like 105 dB or something like that. That was an expensive stereo, so naturally I wanted to keep that stereo working, and the backlight on the display was getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and then I, I purchased this kit to replace the backlight on the display of that stereo. And this is before me doing YouTube videos. I mean it's a shame I didn't do a video about it, it would have been interesting. Yeah so I actually made a new backlight for that stereo and that worked and that was working fine for a few more years. I ended up selling that stereo in that condition and it, it's still working fine when I sold it. So now you want to get the display apart and actually show you what's going on in here. Like I said, I've already researched this a little bit. I've been in here already once and had a look just to figure out what's actually in here. So first thing we'll do is actually taking this top panel off. Top panel off, and then we can take the front bezel off. And there is the naked display. And it's got a 14 pin header at this end, which has been angled not right 90 degrees. Although they probably could have got that straight on, but they did that with it. And it looks like 
a standard 40x2 display. You saw that on when you know, it was powered up anyway. And the mounting stuff are the same. So here I actually have some 40x2 displays. I've got a few different ones. I've got like a yellow, a green, and a blue. Now this isn't going to get much use. This is going to be the sort of thing that gets used very rarely. So I'm not worried about having a display which I don't like on it. And I don't particularly like blue displays. I got this one because I was just tinkering around with different display types. I've got a few different styles of display, you know. And they all actually work just fine. My plan is to actually literally just swap it out. Now one of the problems with this is that this is much thicker than this one. The depth is much greater. It's like double the height. So that needs to be looked at because these have got metal standoffs in here which I think are actually part of the chassis because I thought right if I'm going to plug this in I need to put a right angle header on so I've already done that. It will probably work. This is obviously LED backlight. This is electroluminescent. Not hard to convert between the two. Hard at all. We just don't use the backlight driver on this thing anymore. You just unplug it. That's the plan is to take this display out and replace it with this one. Now the only tricky thing I think is these standoffs. It sort of knows that because I think they are part of the chassis. So it looks like it's pressed into the aluminium plate here. It looks like it's one piece. Now I was actually hoping that it's just like a threaded stud, which this is then just a spacer from, but I don't think it is, because I loosened one of these screws off a little bit, and that did not come loose. So I think that is one piece, unfortunately, which makes this a bit trickier to deal with, because I kind of need to get this out, or cut these down, if I need to put on a thicker display. So let's pull this front panel out. This plugs in here, so let's pop that off. As you can see, I'm using the perfect size screwdriver for this. The one that's too big. Uh, they've got the driver here. Actually, let's take the driver off, because we won't be using that anymore. We'll get this out of the way as well. No, I'll leave the driver in place. I'll leave it intact. That can stay in there, it's unplugged. And I will just make sure it's left unplugged, which is this connection here. Now, I might actually look at replacing the wires on this. Can I swap this out? I can. So I can actually pull the wires out of this plug here and put new ones in. So I can actually just get this driver, cable tie all these wires out of the way, and insert new wires into this and use this to power the new display. Sounds like a plan. Right, let's get this display out. So it's got a little bracket on this side. I don't know that's a good problem, because I can't get to the screw. It's behind it. I might have to pull the sticker off to get to that screw. Well, let's get this side out first. So it's got a little cover there because of the high voltage that's normally sitting on here. Shall we see what that voltage is? Let's power it up and see what we're actually getting here, just out of curiosity. Power that up. And let's measure on here. What do we get? Now, it'd help if I plugged it back in again, eh? Let's plug it back in. <laughs> and now I can hear the warning. It's much better. Okay. There you go. 193 volts AC. So that's why it's got a little cover over there so you don't accidentally touch it if you're poking around. So I say use my spudger here, get down to the side so I can get to this little screw in here. So I can get that little bracket off. Or at least loosen it. Just loosen this off here. Tweezers, bolt out, there's the display with the wires for the backlight driver. So I'm going to desolder this, and like I said, I'm going to leave these wires all like caught up inside to keep it original. You never know if I can replace this display or repair this display. Actually, I think that backlight I had wasn't big enough anyway. That backlight film, it was only sort of this sort of size, wouldn't be big enough to do the whole thing anyway. Yeah, so I'm going to desolder this and just keep that part original, and I'll Maybe I'll try and fix this one day, I don't know. Maybe I'll put it back in again. Because I do quite like the colour, because it's orange. It's actually quite a nice colour, I quite like it. So, let's pop this off. Again. And pull these wires out, so I'm going to use the original plug. Hopefully I can pull these wires out. If I'm lucky I can. They're in there pretty well. Here we go, that's one, two. Like I said, I'm just going to get these wires here and just cord them up out of the way, out of one side, to keep it original as much as possible at least. I don't like to modify things too far from original. 
there's no harm in this just sitting here like this you know just like that you'll be fine and I can use this plug for the new wiring to go to the display easy enough so this display here this is a standard 16 pin header display like a parallel display yeah this has got a 14 pin plug and the original one was a 14 pin header now the extra two pins pin 15 and 16 they are what's used on the backlights and these more modern displays well <laughs> relatively modern displays just aren't particularly modern really so 15 and 16 the backlight now because i had already done a bit of a check on this thing and figured out what was in here and i just had a look at it and figured out okay right that looks like it's all standard so i actually already put a 14 pin header on this board and angled it ready to go onto this connector it should work i'm pretty confident it will work this end here is when i can wire onto the power to do the backlight this is the thing that always throws me right is anode cathode I always struggle with anode cathode, or is it which one's the positive? I always struggle with that. I always have to try it and find out. I just don't remember it. I just matter what I do, I cannot remember which one of those goes to the positive. <laughs> it just doesn't stick in my head. I don't know what it is. So right, we'll try this out and we'll see if it actually does work. It'll be upside down. That's what you're gonna get. Turn the power on. And yes, we have a display. Get it in focus. There you go, display is working. So all we've got to do now is sort out the backlight. Let's do diode test on this thing. That one. The A goes to the positive. That's lighting up. I can see it lighting up. You won't be able to see it, but yeah. Okay. That's probably right. There's flux in here. It's a little off moving around and I can see there's quite a bit of flux left on those connections there from that front panel. Obviously when I manufactured it because it's all hand soldered that bit. They put a flux behind. So I'm going to cut off these posts using a Dremel. And what I'm going to do is work out the depth I need to cut the posts off to. So the original display is 6.6mm .6 there, 6.3 there, 6.4 there, 6.3, 6.4, let's call it 6.5, eh? Let's just go slightly more. I mean, yeah, 6.5. Let's do that. So the difference between these two is what I've got to take off. So you've got 11.3, so that's like 5 mil. 11.4, 11.4, yeah, okay. So I'll take 5 mil off this. I'll make this post 5 mil shorter, then that'll be the, the right amount. Now the tricky bit is going to off exactly the right amount of all, all of them. So, yeah. Just set this to 5 mil and see if I can get a line set at about the right point. Look at that, exactly five. So let's just try and, can I put a scratch down it? Sometimes you put scratches down. Sometimes this works. I can kind of see scratch marks. It's not great. The other way is to actually get something which is five mil thick and actually put it on the end, flush on the end and then like draw a line around it. Now what I can actually try doing, now I put some scratches on it, is get some pen and wipe it off. And if I'm lucky, it'll get into the scratch. Show the scratch up some more. If I'm lucky. Just to create some more contrast. Yeah, it kind of helped slightly, but not much. It ain't great. So I'll just cut the first post off. I'm about half a millimetre longer than I want to be. I want to be 12 mil long. I'm about 12.5 on this one. So I'll get the next one a bit closer. But I'm not too worried about being slightly long. Being sure to be a bit more problem. Um, being a bit long is fine, because I can always grind it off a bit more with the stone. I'm not worried about that at all. Trying to get it close to right is the important thing. That look about right. What I've got here is that I can't get in there this way with it really. It's always fun. Right, this way I can't really get into either. I have to get this way. So I know I've got to cut a five mil off. 4.95, that's perfect. So that's the post cut down. I have to just refine them a little bit using the grinder just to get them flatter on the end so the ends weren't wonky and uh, try and get them about the same height. They're all very close, there's not much in it, it's like 0.1 of a millimetre or something like that. And somewhere I've got another screw. Somewhere there's another screw. Oh there it is, there, yeah, because I should have used this one. Doesn't matter, it's just this cover, which I don't need for this because it's not high voltage anymore. I'm going to leave this little springy plate here just in case it's a shielding thing or something, who knows. 
shouldn't really matter, but it's on the originally, so I'm going to keep it the same way. This side is still definitely slightly longer. You can see it. So it's just resting against the front panel. Yep, so bottom corner still. Still that one there, still a little bit too long. This end's looking good. But this end's looking a little bit too close still. So it's actually touching on that corner. And it's actually what's pushing it out. I might have to grind it just slightly more. Am I perfectionist? No. Okay, maybe a little bit. So I'm going to try using a Zener diode to form a voltage drop. Because this is a 5 volt supply it's going to be running from. And I don't really want to run 5 volts into the back of the backlight. I mean, it can kind of do it, but it doesn't really need to be stressed that much. So I've got a 3.3 volt Zener here. Now, 3.3 volt, you think, oh, that's only give you 1.7. Not true, because it depends on the current that's passing through the Zener. Right, the more current, the more drop you get down to that point. So 3.3 volts, it's a guide. For less current, you're going to get a less drop. Let's actually have a look and see what voltage we're getting here. Hold to the Zener. When I turn the power on. Let's see what we're getting. Make sure we're not shorting anything out. 4.1 volts. Right, so it's dropped it down by 0.9 volts going through a 3.3 volt Zener. I'm happy with that. That's definitely taking the stress off it. It's running at 44 milliamps. That should be fine, I reckon. All right, I'm going to solder this thing in. Now it's got to do the same sort of thing with the diode, with the wire on it. So I've soldered the diode on here. It's not pretty, but it'll do. Prettiness doesn't matter when it's being covered by heat shrink. I might see if this lights up or not. Since I've just shoved the wires into those connectors. Worst case, I sold them straight to the board. Backlight is not going. Ugh. Hold on, check the voltage, just make sure I've got the right way around. Oh, I do not have it the right way around. <laughs> oh dear, typical, get in the backwards. For all the effort. So there you go, that's the front panel back together. Display is in, that looks much better than it did before. Well, it's visible now. I don't think it looks better. <laughs> I actually really like the orange display, that looked quite nice. I'm not a fan of the blue displays. The reason I use the blue on this one is because this is a device which isn't going to get much use. And I'd rather save my nicer looking displays for bits of equipment which might need a nicer looking display. This is fine for this. It's it's alright. But it works. That's the main thing. It took a bit of effort getting the buddy connector to work. That's all working now. So let's use the original connector just there. Positive is the top side there. <laughs> all right. Top rail was the positive one. 5 volts coming in. So the next thing I'll do... Now we've got the display done, pull the board out, change its capacitors. So I'll pull this board out of this thing. Now one thing is these two plugs here, they both got five pins on them. And they're both the same type of plug. So if you pull this thing apart yourself and when to reassemble it, it's there's a possibility you could get in the back to front. And that could be quite a bad thing seeing as one of these comes from the transformer. <laughs> Yeah, watch out for that. It's only got four wires, but it's got a five-pin plug. So I've actually marked these with a line, so you can't get them mixed up, hopefully. Take the side panel off this, because you've got to get this bracket here unmounted off the side panel. The regulator's all mounted on. That's got to come off, and then we can unplug everything and take the screws out and lift the board out. So we've got to start on this side here. So, another panel. We've got two panels to take off, apparently. Yep, there we go. There's the screws to that bracket there, which have captive setups on there, so I should better take these screws out. So let's unplug everything and then take the screws out. One thing we'll chat for with these IC socket types, when you put them back in again, don't accidentally bend a pin. Or don't hook them on things when you're trying to take the ball out and things like that, because they can happen, they can get hooked up. And you can easily bend a pin if you're not careful. Now it's got dip switches over here, I should point this out. Make note of the dip switches in case you bump them. So in this state they are all to the right apart from number eight. Number eight is facing the other way. 
Make a note of that in case you knock them when you're moving the board around. So, lock them. Something I should probably do on this as well is actually um, pull the EEPROM and make a backup of it. I doubt there's any backups of these EEPROMs anywhere. Board is now moving. Something always scares me, like I watch, I'm so a guy, I know he watches my channel too sometimes, so Lou. It's when he's pulling pieces of gear apart, he seems to be quite rough with getting the bits of gear apart, he's, he's not very delicate with them. I always, always look at it sort of cringing, thinking, oh, God, you're going to rip something or scratch a trace off or something or rip a component off because it's got snagged on something. It's, yeah, it just, it just scares me. He always does right because he has reasonable success, but um, it does worry me a little bit. So we've got some bodges on the back here. So there's the board. We've got some resoldering work over here. And we've got some bodge wires. Look like factory originals, potentially anyway. Yeah, flux left on the board there and over here. So either that's repairs or something's been done later on. Makes me think it's repairs because it's the only bits left on there. Maybe I'll give those a clean up. I just don't like to see those left with flux on. Something I forgot to point out is when we're looking at the front panel there, we pull the front panel apart to do the display. Add a date on there of 1980 something. I think it was 88. I think it said 1988 on the back of the display, on the actual back of the panel. Like the actual bezel here. It's printed on the back of that. I put some um, IPA on these, get the flux softening up because it's not going to be easy to get off. And on here as well, put some on there too, just for the sake of cleanliness. And we'll change these caps out. So what do we need? 16 volt 4700. Uh, same physical size and this is a 25 volt, so that'll do. That's that one. What else do we need? 25 volt 100 microfarad. And they're all the same, 25 volt 100 microfarad. Okay, bunch of them. So it's two more capacitors which I missed, which are 10 microfarads, so I've got to change those as well. So let's just pop these ones out. I'm going to push my fifth shoulder on it first, once I find out where I put my solder. Then we'll desolder it with a desoldering gun. Fifth solder just helps to get the things out. I can also just, um, these actually have flux on them, like maybe someone's already changed them. Because there's flux residue here. There's not the ones in the power supply, but these two have got flux residue like they've been changed already. Interesting. Maybe someone's already been here once. Don't forget, the middle screw was loose, so maybe someone has already been here. Or oh, just the fact you didn't clean it up, I don't know. Don't forget the orientation. Negative this way. They do actually have it marked on the board, but sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, there's a positive mark on that side and a positive mark on this side, which are correct. Don't always assume the markings on the PCB are correct. Sometimes they're not. Now this is a rather old PCB with really thin traces, so this would be very easy to damage if you're not careful. I'm actually thinking I might just do a solder blob technique and then clean the holes out afterwards. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, I think I might do that way. These aren't doing great. I'm more worried about damaging the PCB than anything else. So I'll just do it that way instead. Sometimes it's the best way to get them out. Just heat up both legs at once, wiggle the part out, also got to get the heat through the board because it's double sided board, the part's getting pretty hot, <laughs> and it is moving, there we go, there's one, I'm going to repeat the same thing for this one, that's that one out. The holes cleared out. Sometimes that's the easy way of doing it. Shortly goes to the, the positive, eh? That's right, isn't it? Shortly goes to the positive. Obviously, I'm joking. Hopefully, you know that. If you don't know that, don't listen to me. The long leg goes to the positive, or the end with the stripe. Usually, goes to the negative. I have seen capacitors where it's the other way around. <laughs> Watch out for that. It can happen.
Now this thing's big, good as new, hopefully. Still got three more caps to change. Take these ones out and I'll come back. Right, solder these things on. My hand's probably going to be in the way. Better dry time to get the solder to flow through the board. Especially when the ones with the traces on the top side. My iron's not very hot, it's only 290 degrees. I don't use a lot of heat on the iron, especially on these older boards, because I don't like it. The, uh, if you use too much heat on an older PCB like this, the adhesive will actually detach and the traces will just lift off the board. Always use lower heat as possible on older circuit boards. I mean, there's two scores of thought, I suppose. You could say you use the low heat for a long time and just take it gently and just only have as much dwell time as you need. Or the other way is to use a lot of heat and get it done quickly and not give it a chance to actually soak into the board. And that's true too, but I actually found that technique doesn't work that well all the time. Depends on what you're doing, but generally I found using a lower heat and dwelling slightly better on these older boards is um, better for them. They just don't like the high heat, and the high heat will get there pretty quickly to the adhesive, which is underneath the pad you're soldering onto. I found generally better to use a lower heat and take a bit longer on the older boards. New boards, I'd use a lot of heat and be in it, you know, quick, be in it, in and out, quite fast. But uh, older boards, I tend to be slower. Whenever I'm refitting a circuit board, one of the first things I actually do, because there's a chance of getting cables trapped underneath the board, is I actually go around, if I can, and plug the connectors in. So before I actually put the screws in, as I go around and plug in the connectors because sometimes they'll actually point out that hey I've missed one <laughs> it can happen obviously sometimes they can be in the way of other things I plug them all in and there's nothing left to plug in then we should be good this one I'll leave unplugged because we'll get these other screws it's going to be in the way of that that's fine and that one there will go there and that is everything okay there's no more plugs no more connectors haven't left anything underneath the ball it's just a nice little tip to make it easier so you don't mess that up. Of course you've got this bracket on the side which is for the heat sinks on these regulators here. I'm actually going to put a little bit of thermal paste behind that, drip a little bit on the back, just a little bit along there, and I'll attach it to the chassis just to make sure the chassis is taking the heat away. There is nothing there from factory, but there's no harm in adding a little bit. And then I actually attach this first, but I'll probably put these PCB screws in, not tighten them, just get the alignment right. Then I put these ones in, that will then be aligned up and tighten these ones first, because this is obviously the critical thing. The ball can move around, but if you put this ball down first and then attach the bracket, you can actually be pulling, you can be pulling on a PCB and you could be stressing it and, and trying to bend it. So it's best not to do that, especially regulators because you can actually crack the traces on the, the pads on the regulators. So put the screws in, align everything, then do the bracket first, then do the PCB. There's always a reason to do it a certain way. Right, so I've replaced the capacitors, refitted the ball, plugged everything back in again. Everything's probably plugged into the correct place. Let's power it back up and see if it goes bang, or if there's any smoke. When your capacitors explode, because I put them in backwards, despite double checking, because you know how that goes. Beautiful, still works. No bangs yet, we'll give it a second. We're looking good, okay. <laughs> dip switches are still in the right place. Always double check the dip switches. They haven't been knocked, and they're still correct. Right, that's it, excellent. That's that project just about done. Just gotta put the top back on again, and the side panel, obviously which we took off to get to this piece here. Oh, we should check the capacitors. We need to see what the caps are like. Right, let's check these capacitors and see what we're actually getting. So we'll start with the biggest one, which is a 4700 microfarad. Uh, hmm, that's a bit low. Yes, I put four. that looks all right though, but the capacitance is a bit low. 47 meters right on like 10% low, so hmm. So this one here, and I'll do three of them in the in a row, which is the 100 microfarads, 25 volts, 1.1 ohms, 98. Yeah, not too bad. Next one, 96, 1.01, slightly better. Nothing horrendous so far. 1.4. There you go. This one's on the way up. So yes, this one was on the way up. The one is caps. Does actually look like it's slightly bulged. Interestingly, is the second one I tested. I don't know if you see it on these or not, but the middle one has got a very slight bulge in the top, which is why I actually wanted to recap it. And that was the one that measured reasonably okay. We've got these other ones now, which are the 10 microfarads. Get okay, nine, that's 12 ohms. That's up there, isn't it? And the next one. 
the 11 ohms. Yeah, they're a bit on the high side, really. Let's look at the chart here. And it says 19 ohms worst case, but I don't know. To me, they seem a bit high. They seem a bit on the high side to me.